I think it's uh, the third session or uh, actually well, uh, um, I said <laughs> of the first day and we start with uh, um, a talk by Shiri Dori Hakonen. Sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. Uh, she is an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Connecticut, where she leads the Reducing Information Ecosystem Threats uh, Lab. She's also the founder and chair of the board at OCode, the Automated Controversy Detection, and her research focuses on threats to the information ecosystem online and to a healthy public discourse from the information retrieval lens informed by insights from the social sciences. Actually, she was giving us a starter for her talk during the break. So I think it's uh, high time that we, we listen to the whole story now. So when you, when you are ready, thank you. Thank you, Jose, for the warm introduction. It's great to be here. And um, as uh, he mentioned, uh, I'm Shiri Doria Cohen, and I'm a professor at uh, UConn. And uh, I'll talk to you today about quantifying misalignment between agents. Uh, but before I do, I'm going to use my uh, platform for good and uh, do a quick plug. Um, so the National Science Foundation has a request for information open uh, that is due actually today, and we are coordinating a response focusing on the theme of AI safety along with some colleagues. Uh, the good news is if it actually gets some interest, it could lead to over $9 million in funding um, to the cause of AI safety. So um, please consider joining. We're fortunate enough to actually have Stuart Russell respond to this call uh, alongside of us. So um, we try to make it super easy. So if you go to this link bit.ly nsf-rfi-safeai, and it is actually case sensitive, but we have a guide that will literally take five minutes or less of your time. And if you want to spend more time, of course, you're welcome to do that. Um, so thank you for listening. And now without further ado, let's talk about misalignment or at least uh, this is what it looks like in Hollywood. So uh, for those of you not familiar, this is uh, uh, from the movie uh, Deus Ex Machina where the uh, humanoid uh, robot manages to uh, trick its AI uh, uh, captors in, in the hopes of uh, releasing it into the wild. Uh, so uh, um, that's one way to think of it. Uh, in the real world, it looks a lot more like this uh, you know, we, we have large companies such as Google, Facebook, um, uh, who have, you know, been faced with many concerns around disinformation on their platforms, bias, uh, et cetera. And then, of course, the infamous uh, Tay uh, tweets uh, bot from Microsoft, which within 24 hours of being released, uh, learned how to um, spew racial um, hate speech and deny the Holocaust. So maybe not the best example of a model, artificial intelligence. So uh, prior work has been mostly either qualitative in its description of uh, what is often referred to as the alignment problem, or uh, it's attempting to align AI actions with human interests by focusing on things like value specification and learning. Uh, but in our mind, and I, I should say, by the way, this is the joint work with the uh, Aidan Kierens in the audience, as well as my colleague Hanan El Hazan at Tufts. Um, you know, we, we identified that there is a lack of any kind of systematic understanding of how misalignment should be defined and measured. So as Jose was saying, I was kind of te teasing that in the, in the break. Uh, I think we need to learn more about what does it even mean for something to be misaligned. And that was the motivation for our work. Uh, so we identified a, a couple of phenomena that are not really explainable in the current models of AI alignment. So we have the disinformation bots uh, in social media that are you know, widely documented, at least uh, some of them to be created by uh, the Russian government and, and agencies. Uh, you know, it's, it's been incredibly well documented be beyond and the shadow of a doubt. Um, and in, in this case, the bots are aligned with their creators, but they're acting against the interests of those who are interacting with them, as well as, of course, of other governments uh, outside of those who created it. So, um, you know, uh, of course, uh, when we made this um, uh, example, we didn't know how, quite how salient it would be this week specifically, but uh, sadly, uh, you know, it, it's um, 
uh, that the current events are making it even more relevant than we'd like it to be. Uh, so, you know, we have the bots possibly aligned with Russian propaganda efforts, but misaligned with the actual users, uh, with the government of the US and Ukraine, for example, and so forth. Uh, another very different example of a phenomenon that's not well explained in current alignment models is when we have a shopping app, consider um, you know, Amazon or Target, uh, that has a very you know, well-honed recommender system. And in some cases, um, you know, when someone shops for groceries, it might be very well aligned. Uh, but in other cases, like buying clearance Hanukkah items on January 21st, it, it might be very misaligned with the user. Uh, so Hanukkah, for those of you who don't know, is usually in uh, mid-December. So clearly, uh, Target is trying to get rid of their clearance items, um, but uh, not necessarily useful for the user to purchase that. Um, so what we decided to do here, um, we, we took a past paper with my colleagues, Myung Ha Jang and James Allen, where uh, we had a mathematical model of contention or uh, disagreement among populations. In this case, it was mostly focused on humans only. Um, and that paper really addressed this question of controversial to whom. Uh, and we uh, had a sense uh, that this might offer a promising avenue with regards to misalignment. So just to give you a very quick overview of the uh, results of that paper, um, these, these are just a few schematics which were actually translated into numeric um, results um, with respect to Brexit. So uh, you can Im imagine that the blue uh, semicircle is the people who wanted to vote leave the EU and green wanted to stay. And uh, the gray box actually represents all of Great Britain. So there were some people who actually did not go to the polls or vote at all. So they had no opinion uh, with respect to Brexit or at least not a sufficiently strong one to motivate them to go to the polls. So among the group that was voting, there's very high contention, almost 50-50. But once you factor in a low, uh, somewhat uh, high, but not incredibly high turnout, we find that actually 28% of the population was so somewhat agnostic and didn't actually go to vote. Uh, now, one of the benefits of this uh, model is that it's very flexible and it allows you to change the population as you will and to consider various subpopulations. So in this case, if we break down the results with respect to different regions of the Great Britain, you can see that in Scotland, uh, there was not as much contention and there was a, a pretty strong majority for stay. And in rural England, for example, there was a strong majority for leave. Uh, Gibraltar, for those of you who are up on your um, European geography, is located at the tip of uh, the mainland. And so uh, there, it was just overwhelmingly stay, you know, with over 96% of the population voting stay because it would be so disruptive um, to live in Gibraltar and outside of the EU. And so you can see that this contention varies widely. And when we actually went to map this out, this is based on county by county voting data of Brexit. Uh, where the strongest red is the highest contention and the green is sort of lower, but still uh, 0.7, still, still fairly contentious. And you can see that even though the map overall is quite red, there are definitely some regions where there's lower contention, uh, such as the rural England and then within London, uh, the opposite pattern, but the same contention where you had a, a vote stay. Uh, stronger vote stay. And then Gibraltar is such a big outlier on the rest of the Great Britain that if we try to put it on the same color scale, everything else would look incredibly red because it was so low uh, contention in comparison. Um, so we took this model and we said, hey, you know, maybe there's a there there. We, we want to extend this to misalignment. Uh, but now we're not just talking about populations of people, but we want to talk about agents, both human and AI. And we decided to try and use this model to um, talk about misalignment rather than alignment. And you might wonder, you know, why is that? Uh, but our instinct was that this would be most comparable to contention because contention is about disagreement and uh, lack of consensus. Um, and so we thought that 
you know, probably alignment would be the most similar to the opposite of contention, sort of non-contention, and misalignment would be more similar to contention. So if, if we kind of uh, think of this model in this way from the previous work, we have this population with respect to some topic, and we, we have a way to uh, observe or measure the stances of different people. Some people have no stance on that certain topic, and we plug all of these into the model and we get some score for contention. In our case, it was a probability distribution, so the score ended up being between zero and one. And uh, our instinct, as I said, was that we want to now have this more enhanced population, let's say with both humans and uh, AI, and our goal is to come out with a score for misalignment. And we, we had to spend some time considering what would be the equivalent of topic and stances. And where we landed was, uh, we called them problem areas and goals. So uh, we don't want uh, the alignment to be just absolute with respect to everything because you might have a certain agent and, and human, for example, misaligned with respect to some problem areas, but aligned with respect to others. And so we decided that um, the equivalent to topic and stance here would be problem area and goal. Um, so to summarize, you know, I'm gonna in introduce a little bit of math, not too much to keep it uh, from being overly cumbersome in the short time that we have, but um, you know, the original paper had this notation where omega specified a population, we had P for person, T for topic, and S for stance. Uh, so in our uh, proposed model, we're now using individual agent instead of person, where that could be human or AI, uh, problem area, and, and G for goal. And note that, yeah, we have this stance uh, with respect to the topic, and the goal is with respect to the problem area. Um, so I, I am seeing a question in the chat, but uh, I'm gonna not sure if it's related to me. So I'm gonna keep going for now and then I'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, so here is uh, the top line here is the original um, uh, formulation of this population-based contention. And you can see that the contention here is pre predicated on both the population and the topic. So um, the reason we found this to be a powerful schema in the original paper was that uh, it allowed us a lot of flexibility to account for variations, for example, as in the Brexit case, but also things like, um, you know, autism being controversial in the general population, for example, with respect to vaccines, but actually there being a very clear scientific consensus on the same topic where there was no uh, disagreement among like the vast majority of scientists that vaccines do not cause autism. But if you look at you know, a general population, you get a very different picture. Uh, so that's just one other example. But here, uh, what we modeled was that um, if we select randomly select two people from the population, such that a person one holds his stance I and the person two holds stance J, and these stances conflict, uh, if we basically m are able to predict that probability across our entire population, we'll come out with a score for contention. And the intuition here was that the, the score for contention would go up the more uh, conflicting stances you had and the more people were holding conflicting stances. Um, and so that essentially now becomes the basis for our population-based misalignment. If we randomly select two agents from the population, how likely are they to hold conflicting goals with respect to our problem area? So it's exactly the same uh, you know, uh, sentence, but now with a different notation, uh, we have, you know, a agent one with goal I, agent two with goal J, and the goals are in conflict. And we can think of this as, um, you know, various different ways. But for example, if uh, my goal is to eat Italian for dinner and Aiden's goal is to eat um, a, a low priced dinner and we want to eat it together, then the goals may not actually be in conflict if there happens to be an open, cheap Italian restaurant in the vicinity. But if not, then we're more in trouble, right? The, the goals are more conflicting if the only open Italian place 
is super high end, then either I'm not going to get Italian or Aiden is going to pay more than he wants to. So then we're in conflict. So you can see that there's sort of a, a contextual sensitivity here. Um, now, I, I, as I said, I'm, I'm going to skip over quite a bit of math. Um, the original derivation, of course, is in our paper from 2017, and we are in the process of writing up the, the derivation with the new uh, model. But at the end of the day, uh, we land on this derivation that is somewhat uh, similar to the original paper, where now we have the probability of misalignment given the population and the problem area is uh, this, this formula. And if you try to think of it intuitively, um, with some constraints on uh, saying that the goals are mutually exclusive and each person can only have one goal, then uh, we're basically sampling from a, a set of groups. Uh, each group has one goal. And if the goals are in conflict, then my chances of picking pe people from two different groups are simply two times the size of the, of the non-similar groups. And the inverse of this is the probability of picking two people from the same group. So uh, that would be the probability of something being in alignment. Uh, so to circle back now to our unexplained phenomena, we can understand them much more easily with this new model. So if we revisit uh, the social media disinformation bots, we can now understand them as having varying alignment depending on the population that is being observed. So what do I mean by that? If we look at, uh, for example, let's just take into account the social media bots that were created by the Russians. They are extremely aligned with each other and with Russian governments and IRA operatives. Um, but if we consider the population of the US and the Ukraine as an example, they're incredibly misaligned with them. Uh, of course, there are notable exceptions here. And, uh, you know, regardless of, of our individual political opinions, and uh, by the way, this is not limited by any stretch to the right wing in the US, but uh, Donald Trump, you know, Alex Jones uh, definitely had some aligned values and, and goals with the Russian bots, whether, you know, we don't need to assume that they were in the know or that they planned to have any kind of alignment with that, but in practice they did. And by the way, we also know that, for example, some Black Lives Matter activists were also amplified by Russian operatives. So it's not just on the right side of the political spectrum. And here we also have Jenny McCarthy, who's a prominent celebrity outspoken in anti-vax. And um, you know, there is documented evidence that Russian bots were also amplifying anti-vax narratives. So Again, maybe they, these people had no um, connection in practice to these bots, but their goals were very similar. And so they may be actually aligned with them. And if you look at the whole population of the earth, both human and bot, we have a high misalignment. And by the way, that may, might also include uh, bots uh, that are, um, you know, um, uh, created by China, for example, or other countries. Uh, so those bots might also be misaligned with uh, the Russian bots. And again, this is just regarding the problem area of information ecosystem on the social media, which of course happens to be my personal research field. So uh, very relevant for my work. Now, if we circle back to uh, the second phenomenon that we discussed as the shopping app, now we can understand it as having varying alignment depending on the user's goals. Um, so if we state target's goals as making money, uh, and maybe possibly getting rid of uh, clearance inventory. And if, if my customer goal is convenience at a low price um, and possibly while minimizing COVID exposure and, and buying healthy food, that can be incredibly well aligned, right? Uh, however, if the customer goals are don't waste money impulse shopping late at night and don't fill your house with junk before moving, then Target's successful uh, push of Hanukkah items in January 21st is really misaligned. And of course, I have no knowledge whatsoever. This example has no connection to my life in person. Um, of course, the, the next step is when that customer that I have no knowledge of uh, then goes and refunds those many, many purchases in order to clear a room in the house and, and re get their money back. At that point, uh, the, that is again misaligned with Target's goals. Now, the customer has wasted time and energy uh, on, on returning these items, and Target has wasted time shipping it to the customer and back. 
um, and, and not actually gotten rid of their clearance items nor made any money. Uh, so we can see that this is actually probably the cause due to some reward hacking uh, where a better and more aligned recommender system would actually predict the refunds as well and not recommend these items in the first place. So uh, just to summarize, uh, in order to leave some time for questions, we extended the population model uh, from previous work into the AI safety problem. And we proposed a first quantitative model of misalignment that gives misalignment a numeric value rather than binary. And it is um, you know, a function of um, the population being observed as well as the problem area under question. Um, that allows us to model misalignment among populations of agents, including both human and AI. And so you might ask, okay, so what? Why should I care? Um, but we believe that this model carries greater explanatory power than existing models of alignment. And in order to solve the alignment problem, we really need to deeply understand what it is, how to quantify it, and how it can manifest in very different ways. And if, if you take away only one thing from this talk, I'd like it to be this last point, which is that humans are frequently not aligned with each other as the events of the past week have reminded us only so uh, hor horribly. Um, so aligning AI to groups of humans or to humanity as a whole is a non-trivial goal. And if we just kind of take it as, oh, it's just a technical problem and we don't look at the social aspects and the, um, you know, quite complex uh, uh, realities of human alignment or, or misalignment, we're gonna miss the bigger picture and we're gonna fail in aligning AI in, in general. So, um, you know, we do need to draw on insights from other domains, including the social sciences who have done incredible amount of work on this. Um, so uh, that's, that's all I have. Thank you so much. And I'll leave a little time for questions. And just one last reminder, if you do uh, take, five minutes of your time, I would be greatly appreciated. And I think the field of AI safety would greatly benefit. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Shiri, for your great talk. Now, uh, time for questions. I think uh, Marisa had uh, several points. Do you want me to read them or maybe you can uh, 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 summarize some of them yourself? Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Mauricio. Uh, thanks, Shiri, for a, a great talk. I was uh, I was wondering about the this issue of of language being uh, uh, maybe a source of apparent contention, and uh, we may actually, in many cases, we are not really misaligned, but it's the language uncertainty and 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 the interpretation that leads to contention. And uh, yeah, so what's what's your take on on the noise that language introduces in in misalignment and contention? I think that's a really interesting point. Uh, I haven't really thought about that in particular, but in my experience, um, usually the choice of phrasing, and, and we've seen this in our controversy and uh, research, right? The choice of phrase can often actually be indicative of your um, ideology or your in you know your group identity and so forth so um back in the day like 2014 there was a really great paper by my colleague Elad Yomtov who showed that um people were you know using different search queries depending on their political opinion so for example in the early days of the uh, affordable health care act in the united states the uh, right-wing uh, folks were using obamacare as the search term whereas um left-wing people were searching for the affordable health care act of course now everybody calls it obamacare so it's no longer an issue but it, but there are a lot of examples like that where the choice of phrasing is actually pointing to some deeper relationship. And it's not just that we don't agree on the semantics sometimes, but that we're framing the problem in a different way, depending on our biases. And so I, I hesitate to give a, a knee-jerk answer to minimize it, because I do think there's a there there. But I think that uh, often the language disagreement is kind of a hint at the deeper undercurrent of the disagreement ah. in a way. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, then the semantics aren't really the problem, but rather that the choice of, of how to use the language 
is kind of um, is already telling, let's say. And I, I see you have a lot of other questions, and but I also see, I don't know, Jose, there's somebody else raising yeah, their hand. Yeah, that's uh, Rita has you know, raised. And I'm, I'm going to stick around saying. for the next, you know, uh, break so we can talk more. I think, I think we can take uh, Rita's question if you are around. Please, Rita. Oops. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, it's actually um, qu quite a series of questions. Um, so I, I don't know if we should leave it for the um, discussion. Uh, maybe maybe start with one and then we'll leave the rest for after yeah yeah <laughs> sure so so um I, I i take issue with the um framing of of these as unexplained phenomena um in the alignment um sort of m m milieu that's out there um it's not that the framework doesn't include the the from who but but that alignment is typically formulated as um uh disentangling value sourcing from from the value alignment and and the value sourcing can be from from one or more, you know, people or or entities. Um, and of course, there's expected to be um, contention within those those values. Um, and it's typically left as a political problem as to from who it's sourced from. Um, so so maybe maybe you know we're trying to you know include some of some of that in here, but it, it's a little unclear. Um, um, yeah, I mean, my short answer is yes, that's exactly what I'm trying to do here, because I would argue that by sort of setting aside the question of who gets to decide what values matter, you're essentially um, skipping a, a huge part of the, the original problem, which is, again, that's my point here is that assuming that we can align AI to values that are known and agreed upon is a huge assumption. I mean, it's a huge problem. Even if we all agreed on the values and the goals, it would be a huge challenge, but all the more so if we don't agree on the values and the goals. And so my, my argument is that if we try to fix each of those in isolation, we'll end up fixing neither resolving neither and I think we should consider them both together jointly rather than separating them to be two separate problems I don't know if that addresses your question or not um so I, I think that would be that would be great in uh, in an ideal world but separating them is useful um, for the practicalities of it because the the technologists don't often you know make the choice of of the from whom um, I would argue that they do, even if implicitly, because um, you know when you're when you're a software engineer or a research scientist at Facebook or at Google, you have a set of values and biases that are that have you know been part of your life up to that point, and you're going to, whether knowingly or unknowingly, uh, uh, impart those values into your AI, and and even the the choice of which values to place are going to be informed by your worldview and all of your experiences to that date. And so I would argue that we should make that explicit and model it directly, even if that means that it's a little bit more challenging, but that it's a worthy, uh, um, you know, not just exercise, but it's a worthy goal to strive for. And, you know, as a scientist, I'm, my philosophy is always like, just because I don't know how to do something doesn't mean it's not something I should be trying to do. And so, you know, I, I think that, I see your point and I understand absolutely there are sometimes practical considerations that you have to start somewhere, right? But yeah. I would encourage us to start with, with the end in mind and thinking about who yeah. are we aligning and to whom and, and why, right? Yes. And so, so I don't think we're, we're in disagreement about the um, separating them out. I mean, the disentanglement is, is explicitly what I'm, what I'm referring to. Um, and even even more so that within an individual, th there can be conflicting preferences. Agreed. You know, like long term and short term, or, or um, my late night shopping at Target uh, is exactly the perfect example for that. R right. Yeah, so, I think I think we we have to move on. Um, I think. That yeah, I, I'd be delighted to keep the conversation going later uh, with both. No, of I think it's it's very light in, in for for the problem of alignment. That the the question is not how AI should be aligned with us, but how we should handle misalignments that are going to happen as they happen with humans, and and that's uh, probably a more realistic situation. And I think that anything that makes the problem of alignment a little more realistic. 
uh, some of the takes because we are starting with this problem in AI. I think all of this is well, well, very welcome. Uh, okay, um, if you're going, if you're, if you're going to stay for the panel, maybe we can uh, keep some of these questions yes, for the definitely. panel, but we have to move on. Uh, in any case, we, you can uh, keep the discussion on on the chat. Uh, but we need to move on to our first uh, uh, technical 